Everybody has a story, and every story needs to be heard. On this podcast, we are talking with each member of the General Conference Leadership Council. I'm your host, Alyssa Truman, and this is ANN Profiles. Today, I am here with Elder Billy Biaggi. He is one of the General Vice Presidents of the General Conference. Hello, Elder Viaggi. Thank you. Nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you, too, although I, it's not the first time we've met each other. So, <laughs> yes. you know, I, we have the distinct privilege of having you be the vice president over the communication department. So not yes. only are you my vice president, as in for the church, you are my vice president in my role here at the General Conference. So before we get started, because I think sometimes people don't fully understand, what is the job of a general vice president? Well, we have different responsibilities and assignments, uh, like supervisor of communication, also publishing ministry, and Christian stewardship. And also we are chairing some boards, like uh, in my case, uh, Adventist World Radio Board Chair, and then Hope Channel International Board Chair, and uh, many other committees. That so lots of committees yeah, and meetings. Yeah, a lot of committees, <laughs> yes. Like the Church Manual Committee. And you also and, the Working Policy Review and Development Committee. You know, you and I talked about this because we were we had the privilege to travel together to Brazil. Yes. And I asked you about these committees. And um, since that time, I have read, I think, about a third of the Working Policy book oh, for well. fun. Congratulations. Um, <laughs> and I've already read the church manual a couple of times. But it, it's an interesting role to sit on these committees because every general conference session... Yes. So every five years, every quinquinium, as we call it within the church, um, new changes or suggestions, um, additions, edits, whatever, are brought to the body. Yes. Not, not to the GC employees, but to our representative body to vote. And that's the only way changes are made to correct. working policy and church manual, correct? To the f 28 fundamental beliefs. Okay. And the church manual. Okay. Regarding the working policy, it's a delegation of authority to the executive board okay. of the general conference. So those um, amendments or suggestions are done by the executive committee. So, <laughs> Elder Biagi, <laughs> you are from Argentina. I yes. believe, right? Yes. So tell me a little bit about your parents um, and where it was that you were born. Uh, probably I go a little bit further. That's fine. Yes, with great parents. Okay. I don't know if uh, you remember Abraham LaRue. I do. He was one that offered his ministry to the General Conference in the 1890s the last decade of, of the 19th century, he wanted to go as a missionary to China. But at that time, GC didn't find conditions for him to go. And he said, I will go by myself as a self-supporting, like a colporter, a publishing ministry. So he went there to Hong Kong by boat. And at that time, it was so difficult because he, he was not aware of the Chinese language. He needed to find somebody to translate the Bible to Chinese language for him to do the missionary work. But it was very difficult. But he was traveling with this British Navy, you know, British boats, uh, mercant, you know, buying and selling, go all around the world. So he, he started to speak with the captains, with the sailors of those boats, and bring the gospel to them in English. But also he was trying to find somebody to translate to Chinese language. Uh, the history says that he was able to touch the hearts of several sailors. The interesting thing is that in his short life, because after a few years he passed away there, Two sailors returned to England after a few years, and they lived in the southwest city of Plymouth in England. And they were close neighbors of Brooks' family. And since that they embraced the Seventh-day Adventist truth, they shared with this family, friends, the truth, and the father, the mother, and the son, Edgar, became Seventh-day Adventist. Edgar is my grandfather. Wow. 
In 1910, Edgar, with other young men and women, went to one-year training to become missionaries that they, we have there at that time, today's New World College. And Edgar and his brother went through the, through the program, uh, and, and uh, his brother went to Africa. Unfortunately, after one year, he returned with malaria and passed away. Oh, no. Edgar was called by a family to come as a missionary to South America, to Peru first, where he worked in a family and started to preach the gospel, took care of the children, you know, like English teacher. And many people accepted the truth there. In those five years, 1911 to 1915, he was able to learn very well the Spanish language. So he returned in the middle of the First World War to England. When he came, he came through Panama. When they returned, returned through South America, Atlantic. And he was telling the stories when we were kids that it was very dangerous. At night, the captain put out all the lights and the engines and went very slowly. And many boats of British you know, army were sink and, 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 and people soldiers floating, so they rescue many of them. Oh, but wow. thanks to the Lord, they arrived to London with, without uh, any problem. Uh, a few months later, the leaders of the church in Argentina, South America, the South American division at that time had the headquarters in Buenos Aires City. So they, they were looking who can be a missionary that knows Spanish. And they thought Edgar Brooks from England. And Edgar came first single, came in 1916, yet in the middle of the first war, and, and he came and started to work. Immediately they put him, you know, in what position? To be the chief editor of our publishing house. So a British being the one writing in Spanish, because he learned very well the Spanish language, and he has skills to write poems and write very nice articles. So he was the editor of our magazines there during f the following uh, 10 years. And then people said to Edgar, Edgar, you need to get married. Why don't you think about that? And, and that was about um, the year 1918. Edgar thought for a little bit and remember Dorothy. Dorothy Waterhouse was a young lady that also went to the one-year course there. But he didn't know if she, if she was married or what, but had the address of, of the wife of his brother that passed away, Daisy. So Edgar wrote a letter, you know, handwritten, and took months to go there by boat, sent a letter through the Atlantic, to Daisy, for Daisy to find where Dorothy is and give the letter to try to make contact with Dorothy to see what happens. <laughs> but the story is more interesting about God's providences, not only with Abraham LaRue, but also with them, because Dorothy was having vacation time there in the beach that summer, uh, European summer, and, and was there taking a sun bath and saw a, a lady, very familiar face. And then she approached her and said, are you Daisy? And she looked, yeah, oh, hello, Dorothy. Well, tell me about your life. Tell me about what happened with Edgar. That was my friend in the, in the school of missionary. Oh, she said, Edgar went as a missionary to Peru first, and now he's in Argentina. Give me the address. So she gave the address and Dorothy wrote a letter to Edgar. And the letter that Edgar sent and Dorothy sent the across through the Atlantic. Oh, wow. But was the providence of the Lord. To make the story short, after... I don't know if I want the story short. This sounds like a fun <laughs> story. <laughs> it was very amazing. You know, took months to go and return. Edgar was surprised to receive fast, but was because she wrote. She had done it first. in advance. But then uh, they started to receive the impression that the Lord were, was putting. She was single, a professor of English, studying in Cambridge, and, and, and he was a pastor, a young pastor there, editor of a publishing house. So later went and came back. Finally, Edgar proposed Dorothy to, to come to South America and marry him. 
Uh, Dorothy lost the mother because she was the youngest of nine brothers and sisters. And she was living with Frances, the oldest sister, like 20 years old, was like a mother for her. Frances says, well, if your heart is telling you that you should marry Edgar, you should go there. And, all, and, and she helped Dorothy to buy, you know, at that time, it was not suitcases, it was like a wooden big box there with all the things. And um, Frances helped her to buy all the things and went with her to the port of London when Dorothy said goodbye. And, and, and uh, the sister, Frances, gave her an envelope full of money. And she said, these are all my savings. Mm. If you go there and, and the Lord guides your trip and you find that Edgar is not the person that you thought, you have enough money to buy an expensive boat uh, ticket and come back and we continue to live in together. But if the Lord uh, shows you that this is the person that you uh, will love to live with, then you have more money to buy furniture and other things that you will need for your home. They hug, kiss, and Dorothy left. Arrived to Buenos Aires port October 20 of the year 1920. Dorothy arrived and that morning all the leaders and the wife of the church in South America were there in the port awaiting the bride of Edgar. <laughs> So it was a very touching, and Edgar met Dorothy after 10 years. 10 years? Yeah, 1910, oh, wow. the course, and oh. now 1920. And you know what? After six days, October 26, 1920, they got married. After six days. The wow. Lord guided their life. And then my mother, Wendolyn Brooks, was born in Argentina, in Buenos Aires, 1923. Three years later. But my uncle, Roy Brooks, that was a treasurer of the South American Division and, and, and pastor working in Loma Linda, he was born in 1925 in London. You know why? Because at that time, missionaries going abroad, we call interdivision employees, missionaries were serving seven years and one year of furlough that took time to go home be with family and return to the front line. Pastor Edgar Brooks and Dorothy Waterhouse, my grandparents, decided to spend all their life in the mission field in South America. People said, why don't you return, you know, after the Second World War? Why don't you return? It's so nice, Europe and England and all. May you consider to return? And they said, no, we commit our life to the Lord. Mm to be in the front line until the end. And we will rest in the Lord here. And when Christ will come, we will be here in the mission field and we will see the great results of the missionary work. Wow. So that is my... So I introduced you as an Argentinian, but I could have almost introduced you as a, as a British person. <laughs> yes. My mother was British. <laughs> she, she was born there, but had dual citizenship. Got it. Yeah. So you don't have dual citizenship, do you? No. no? Okay. Up to now, I have one only. Just Argentina. one. Okay. So you have quite the family history <coughs> then that traces yes. to missional work. Missionary work, um, yes. What about your parents? What did they do? Well, uh, mother w was growing, as I told you, grandpa and grandma decided to stay in Argentina. So mother grew up, but she never knew if parents later will decide to return to Europe. But when she was in the college level, it, it was the Adventist College there in Argentina, River Plate Adventist College, now is the university, uh, she met Carlos Biaggi, descendant from Italian. Great grandparent came from Italy, non Adventist, came from Italy to Buenos Aires. Many Italians are living in our country, many, many British, many Germans, all, all the European countries. So, so they, they came and uh, uh, got the Seventh day Adventist message in Argentina, my grandparents. So, my dad was born already in an Adventist. Uh, family, and they loved this boy, was the only son hmm. for that family, Armando and Maria Angelica Biaggi, only son, Carlos Biaggi, and when he grew up, he went to our college, 
1944 was one year theology, not four like it's today. <laughs> At that time, it was one year. And he, he, he studied that course, but later he became a professor. He studied in the university, biology, and he became a professor. So part of his life was as a professor, and they married with my wife. So my wife was a British, married to an Italian descendant. Uh, but my dad dedicated his life for the mission of education of our church. Okay. So... Your dad worked for the church. Yes. Did your mom work for the church? Yes, both what did of she them, do? missionaries. She was a translator. Okay. Mother, uh, because my dad came to work in our Adventist college, and, and uh, before he was in other schools in Buenos Aires, also he worked in our university in Chile, but late, the last part, he was at our Adventist college. And, and the task was for him to make contacts with the Minister of Education of the state and the governor and with the Minister of Education of the country for that college to become a university. In 1959, they have already four kids, four children, three boys and a girl, my sister, Bobby, Margaret, I am the third one, Billy, and Charlie, the youngest. In 1959, the church says, Carlos, you should go to America and you sh should go in a trip of one year and visit all our Adventist universities and take ideas and come back to, 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 to complete and to do it a university. And he said, okay, but I don't speak English. They said, that is not a problem because you know, your wife is British, so she will be your translator. Okay, he said, but if we go, what about the four little kids? Oh, you can take them if you pay your tickets. Okay, let's go as a family. And in 1960, we flew from Buenos Aires to Miami. And Daddy bought a car, bought a trailer. We put all our stuff and started the journey of one year through America. Oh, so wow. we went through the East. Uh, we came here to Washington. And we, we saw the, the Columbia Union College, today Washington Adventist University, and Atlantic Union College. And we continued to Andrews University, to Michigan. And the time was passing, the months was passing. And then we went to Nebraska, to, to the Union College. And we were heading to the West, at the middle of that trip, heading to the West for the other colleges in the West. And unfortunately, we had a car accident terrible car accident and the, and the car turned around several times and mother said because the car was left on the roof the four wheels up and all crashed all the windows and so my sister had a small cut in the leg of bleeding a little bit bleeding but, but mother said where is Bobby here Billy and Margaret and Charlie all where is daddy was not there so we went you know, crawling through the broken car all around and, and the door of daddy opened and his body smashed the pavement, crashed the head and all a lake of blood there. Mother knew that he was dead instantaneously. But we were little kids, you know, little kids how cannot... Old were, how old were you? Seven years. Charlie was four years. And Charlie was the one that more suffered because he had a hard time when he was growing up to remember visually our daddy. He suffered a lot. I remember very well, all seven years already. Uh, but we were kids. We could not understand what means death, lack of life, you know. It was a, a shock, a trauma for us. And uh, we thought... And I remember that, speaking among us, the kids, said, let's pray for the doctors to take care of daddy, and let's see if, if, if he can recover. But his life was closed at that time, 38 years old. Wow. And mother, 36 years old, f with four kids. When we communicated with mother, communicated with my grandparents, was very tough to tell. The only son that you had, Carlos, passed away. And they said, although GC offered her to work for the General Conference as a translator. 
uh, because the mission of the church was improving very nicely in inter-America and South America, they needed materials in Spanish. But great parents said, please return to Argentina, return, because the only thing in life that we have now is the four grandchildren. If you stay there and we will not see you, we will die of sorrow and sadness. So mother decided to return. And uh, with the insurance, you know, Adventist Risk Management, insurance of all the workers, with that money, we built the house where we grew up. The four children became missionaries of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And mother was very faithful. She worked for the theology seminary. She translated many books of Andrews University and other theological seminaries in English to Spanish. She was the translator. And our printing uh, shop there in the university printed the books for teachers and for students. And she spent her life in that mission. But you know what? Mother was of great trust. Daughter of missionaries that determined to spend their, their life in the mission field. And mother said to the four kids, morning worship each morning, singing all in English. She spoke to us always in English, singing the songs in English, evening worship at home. She said, kids, because we were crying many times, we, we miss our daddy. And mother said, she was a great woman of faith and trust in the Lord. She said, don't worry. Christ is coming soon, and Daddy will be resurrected. We will hack him, and we will go together to heaven. And in heaven, we will ask the Lord Jesus, why this sad situation happened? Why? And Christ will explain why it happened. And you know what we will say to him? And we were little kids, and we say, what we will say? We will say, thank you so much. But today or during our life, to, to grow up without daddy was a tough situation. But in our minds and hearts was already written, let's become missionaries. Let's help the prophecies and the fulfillment of the gospel of the Holy Scripture in many countries of the world for that great day of reunion to be as fast as possible. So part of your... Um desire to reach 8 billion people. Yes, 8.1. 8.1. <laughs> I'm going to make sure to always keep that point one in there now. Um, obviously, that's a very traumatic experience for any young family to go through. Yes. But I can see that that strongly impacted how you have viewed your life. Yes. That there are 8.1 billion, B I almost said million, but it is billion people in this world. who are hurt um, who are struggling and who need hope. Yes. Uh, although it wouldn't be 8.1 because some of us do have that hope. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. But there's there's so many people longing for this. And I just from having observed and listened to you talk, I can understand now this driving presence behind your desire to reach these people. So, so seven-year-old Billy comes back to Argentina um, without a father. How do you think that event impacted your teenage years? Um, I was looking back to my life, and, and probably we need, each kid needs a, a figure of a man. But daddy's figure was already there in the past. He was not more with us. So probably I was looking now to Uncle Roy, my mother's, a brother, because my dad was the only son. So the only other person in family is to look to Uncle Roy. And he was a pastor and he was an administrator. And probably because of the skills that I had since a kid, a mother relayed much in me for the management of the house. Uh, Bobby picked up the speciality, the oldest brother, Speciality of daddy. He's a professor of science and dedicated his life to be a researcher for Geoscience Research Institute in Loma really? Linda. 
Yes, and he, he was a lecturer uh, many years in America and also in our university in Argentina, professor of, of science and religion, you know, uh, the Bible and the science and all those things. That is a, a, a course, by the way, that we give in all the careers, 33 careers that we have there in that university. So all get to know about the Lord and the science. But uh, I was the, the next boy, Margaret is in the middle, uh, and so mother relay on me. Wait, wait, what did Margaret do? Margaret is a professor, okay. a, pro a professor of music and, and a teacher of elementary school. She's okay. a wife of a pastor, and they spend all their life as missionaries as well. Okay. So, so uh, Billy was the one that mommy said, Billy, you help me with the management, you know, of, of the finances of the family, since I was a kid. Elementary school. But the four kids, including Charlie, the youngest, we worked all summers since we were kids. We worked in, a, in the university. Now, now I look back and say, what a merciful leaders in the university to pick <laughs> up these kids, you know. Other kids can be bothering, you know. But I was the office boy. I worked in... in in treasury, let's say, since I was a kid, I had a bicycle. I need to go and get all the mail. We need to go to another small city where the mail was and bring all all the bag, heavy bag, with all the mail for all the university. And and I will help in in treasury. How uh, how old are you when you're doing all this? Ten years, eleven years, twelve years old. So since you're this ten school. Years. Charlie was a little kid and he worked in the farm. The youngest loved to work in the farm, so he was uh, riding the horse and taking care of the cows. You know, we, we had a, a nice, a, a nice uh, uh, department for, for, for crops and also uh, milk, you know. So Charlie was with the cows all day, since early in the morning until the evening. The four of us work in order to earn the money for studies. But I want to tell you a small story mm -hmm. here. <clears throat> Mother was working as a translator. She was saving all what she could. And we were working in summer to get also for our scholarship. And, and I remember when I was a kid with mother that after she got the salary, we put up aside what money we will need for food during the month and the rest we save it. And we were taking a bus early in the morning to another city and we put in the Argentinian National Bank in savings. At, the, at that time, were like all by written with stamps there, how much money, and this is the balance, then you add more. And this I is remember the that. Well, when all, I was a girl, all, we... All stamped, yeah. all, all by written. So Billy was there checking that all is okay, all our savings, and that was, you know, the academic year there in South America is March to December, or end of November. So December, January, February is the summertime we were working. But at the beginning of March, a new academic year starts. So Billy was going with mother to the bank, and we were withdrawing money. And I remember I was standing with my mother, with the manager of the university, saying, how much is the cost of each one of the four children? And mother was saying, and we had a budget already, and mother was saying, well, what is the discount discount for second son, third son, fourth son, you know, mm -hmm. college had to, to, to receive all the students? And what is the discount if we pay cash in March for all the year? And can you believe the Lord bless us in stewardship? The Lord bless us. And each year since elementary school up to the end of college level, university level, we pay all the expenses in advance. Wow. A widow and children working. The Lord bless us. It's actually a really, it's a really great story because it's, it's, it's a testimony to stewardship. Yes. To being um, faithful in the little things. Yes. Um, to doing whatever God lays at our hands mm -hmm. to do. And that when he does, when we do that, when we do our part, he meets our effort. The yes. human effort with it's, the divine like power. It's like multiplying yes. the resources. Incredible. Because on paper, in reality, none of this should ever make sense. Yes. But it do, math doesn't always have to completely make yes. sense yes. in yes. God's mind. It's amazing. He, he'll multiply what we try to, uh, you know, add. Yes. Um, so, so, so we grew up uh, and, and, and that experience 
plus the experience that I had with Nita, my wife, and the four children that the Lord gave us, because of that experience with my oldest son, that is a missionary in Beirut, Lebanon, today, he's a CPA and has a PhD in business, we wrote a book that our publishing house in South America has printed about how to manage finances and how to be faithful to the Lord with tithe and generous to the Lord with our uh, promises and offerings. So you, you see that all things are important in life. All what we learned since we were little kids are important for us to, to replicate later in our own families. Was there ever a time where maybe as a young person you observed that it was hard to give the money? Like there was other needs because people struggle and sometimes it's hard to be faithful. Do you ever remember having any of those... Uh, we, we learned since we were little kids that little is enough. I remember one pastor that when we were coming here to America and going to the big shopping centers and so on, he was telling us when we looked to him, we were shopping some things for our family and he was not shopping nothing. And I asked him, Pastor, why are you not finding nothing for your family? And he said, I am so thankful to the Lord that I see so many things that I don't need. <laughs> so many things that I, I don't I need. I wish I saw more Can things you I see? didn't need. <laughs> Sometimes we accumulate and, and we fill our garage instead of parking our cars is full of, of stuff there. Can you see? Well, I I'm guilty. I'm guilty. <laughs> I learned that. <laughs> Being called out here. <laughs> I learned that since we were kids because we, we grew up with a faithful mother and uh, little is enough. We have all what we need. We have the house that was the life of our dad through the insurance. And we had clothes and grandpas coming from Buenos Aires who were helping us also. So, so... We didn't struggle so much with expenses, but each individual, each, each uh, boy, uh, each girl uh, needed to take their own decisions in, in life. But the Lord was very merciful. Hmm. The Lord gave us all what we needed. And we were always thankful. You know, you, you need to have an attitude of contentment, of happiness, uh, joy for all what we have. Like David said, all what we are, and what we have, we receive from your hand. And what we are giving back to you is what we already received from you. Yeah. Therefore, no merits in us, only a grateful heart. So I know you become a pastor, so we're going to move towards that university yes. years. But did you always know you wanted to be a pastor? Since a kid. So you always knew you were going to be a pastor. Yes, uh, I need to open my heart a little bit and say I had a small struggle because I had very good skill for business administration, uh, but I wanted to be a pastor also. But I look my uncle, and he was both administrator and a pastor. So I study in the university extra classes of theology and, and, and business administration. So I have a, a diploma as a professor in economic science, and I have a diploma as a CPA, certified public accountant, a master degree in administration, but also uh, the Lord put in my heart since I was a little kid to be a pastor. And although I started to work in business administration, in treasury uh, of the union there in Buenos Aires, uh, always I was involved in, in the mission of the church. I was uh, first at, ordained as a deacon, and then I was ordained as an elder of the church, and we took uh, each year we made evangelistic campaigns for Eastern and, and during the year. So all the people that looked to me as a young worker said, you are a pastor. And in 1986, the church decided to ordain me as a pastor. So, so you had not had a theology background? Uh, I studied courses of theology. So courses, but you don't have a diploma. The diploma in was in business administration. Really? But, but in... At that time in South America, like in other parts of the world, we have professors that are ordained as pastors. We have medical doctors yeah. ordained as pastors. pastors. We have lawyers 
ordained as a pastor. So, so. I guess yes. I just, in my mind, I just assumed all along that like you'd been a pastor like this whole time. <laughs> yes. But it's not the trajectory that I had thought. No. So when you leave the university <coughs> with your um, diploma, diploma, wh what did you actually go and do? I went to work in Treasury of the Union. At that time, many years ago. So you're a treasurer. I am a. I was a treasurer. Yes. I I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> I know it sounds silly, but like I really just envision. I'm going to tell you how I envisioned this, okay? Yeah. You're going to tell me about your first pastorate, and you're going to tell me about this lovely woman you fell in love with, and then you guys pastored <laughs> together, yes. and then you did evangelism together, and you kept pastoring, and yes. then you became a conference pastor. I did not expect for this to start at a yes. Union Treasury office. Yeah, Union Treasury office. Why? Because at that time, uh, we needed to improve the legal accounting of the church. In, in the legal accounting of the church, we had only the title of the properties that the church has, the, the chapels and, and, and the camping sites and so on. But we needed to grow up as a, a civil organization, you know, commercial organization and civil organizations, two codes for laws in Argentina and here also. So, so they said, let's pick up, the leader said, let's pick up this young well-trained people in business administration, let's invite them and let them develop with the lawyers all the accounting books of the church in South America. So that what we were called. And I remember when the treasurer of the union, who was a pastor also, he studied also in administration, but was a pastor, he said, Billy, you are more qualified than me. And he was of the age of my dad. So I said, no, I respect him. You know, he was the union treasurer. And I said, no, no, I respect you. you. You are the boss. No, 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 you study, and we expect that you, with other colleagues, will help us to develop all the accounting books of the church. Wow. And that we made in, in, in several years. How old are you and, when and, you're and doing this? And because of that, I was uh, 22, 23 years <sighs> old. When I was 28 years old, the church said, well, you help us already in the union. You may go as a treasurer, secretary, and treasurer of a mission within the union. If we went to Uruguay, the country of my wife. So I was secretary also and treasurer. So I was acquainted with all the minutes, uh, working policy and all the things. But when I was 31 years, very young, a kid, let's say, in comparison with other <laughs> leaders, uh, they said, Billy, in a, in a constituency of our union, said, Billy, we are choosing you to be the union treasurer. So I went there, very young, you know, and, 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 and they said, well, you have been a, a teacher, you prepare all the accounting, so you are the best qualified. You will be the union treasurer with three countries. Now what we have three, three countries were they? Paraguay. Uruguay and Argentina. Okay. So today, Paraguay and Uruguay are separate union, union of churches. So each year, I was training all the, the treasures of all the church organizations, the conference, the mission, we have seven of them, and all the uh, educational institutions and our hospitals. We have several hospitals, uh, other, well, all the church organizations I was training each year we, we went to, to the camping site with all the people, like 100, 120 people, and we were giving the lectures with other colleagues, training our, our future accountants and the treasurers of all this church organization. And, and that was so that, that later, in the year 2000, in GC session... Wait, wait, wait. You're going too far, you're going yeah. too far forward. No, only to link it. Only <laughs> okay, to link it. okay. And, and we come back. <laughs> uh, in GC session... In the year 2000 in Toronto, Canada, uh, they invite me as a division treasurer of the Euro-Asia division with headquarters in Moscow, Russia. Because they said we need to train all the treasurers there and the accountants as you have trained, you have that experience in South America. And there we went. But coming back to... Wait, wait, wait. yeah, we're going to come back. We'll yes. come back to you know, your union, but you said something that we just can't let go, okay? 
you said that you and your wife, which means you met a lovely young lady at yeah. some point. In start- <laughs> Tell us a little bit about yeah, your wife. Well, uh, that, that we need to go back to the time when I was studying. Okay. When I was studying in, in, in the college, today is the Adventist University. Uh, I was studying business administration, but many classes of theology, as I mentioned. Uh, an extra class in summer, I took more classes of theology. So, but uh, I love music. Since we were in the high school, we were singing in a boys' quartet, men's quartet. And we had all this arrangement of the King Herald from here, from America. And, and we had, we bought it, uh, and, and we knew English. My mother helped to translate all to Spanish language, and we sang it in a quartet. But later, when I studied the college, the college, uh, four years college, then with my close friend, we create a small choir, boys and girls. So it was a pleasant time to be together <laughs> with boys and girls. But we were singing. We were we were traveling to different. You weren't cities. paying any attention to the girls, no, right? No, 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 no attention n- to the girls. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So, and going to evangelistic campaigns were the great preachers that we had at that time. They needed the music, so we were going, performing there, and going to churches for, for programs and to preach and so on, when I was a student. And we created, in 1972, uh, friends and, and, and teachers, we create the mission of the university. It's, it's, it's like an association that we create for all students of theology and other careers to go to different churches each Sabbath to preach the gospel. And, and, but that functioned like a conference. Although we were in, in, in the Central Argentinian Conference, but they gave us like 30 or 40 churches for us to take care. It was, was a, an idea that, that we developed. So I was the first treasurer of that conference of students. And I was managing and getting cars from the neighborhood, from the village, to take all the students as preachers and the girls and to make the program, Sabbath school for kids and all, all the things. Uh, so, so we created. But I love, m- love a lot music. So then in another year, for summertime, you know, I was working in the office, as I told you. We work all our life to, to earn the money for studies. And, and, but, you know, we were living in that village, what to do in the evenings? So we create a choir with 40 boys and girls. And one of the girls was that one that I was looking to, Nita. Whoa. Nita. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and so it was very nice, and we was a very good group. We are close friends up to today of all these kids, all missionaries, different type of life each one had. But uh, with Nita was a special attraction. She was a very nice girl, a nice family. So uh, we decided to, uh, and we got in love, engaged in my last year of studies. But she was studying nursing, so she was in the second year of three years career. But she was so in love. Also, she said, let's get married. <laughs> Forget the studies. I said, no, we need to, you need to finish. And we don't have money, you know, humble family, my family, humble family, her family. So we decided to, uh, I, I, I received a call to go to the union as a young uh, a worker. And so I said, better plan is like this. Look, uh, I will work one year. I will save the money. I will buy all the things that we need for our apartment, our nest of the new couple. And then in that year that I am earning and saving, you will finish your career. You will graduate and then we get married. What do you think? Okay, let's do it. And she got, uh, she got the diploma, the graduation program, a weekend in December. And next weekend was our wedding. And you know what we had? I did the same thing. Yeah? I graduated and two weeks later. I got married. <laughs> Can you see? Oh, we have a similar experience. Uh, it was very rewarding. It and, was. <laughs> and, and with her, she, she was minded to be a missionary and to go wherever the Holy Spirit will guide us and call us the Lord. And our motto of life is, Lord, we are accepting your call. We are answering your call. You know, Isaiah 6, 8 who will go for us? And Isaiah answered, Here, Here am I, I. Send, send me. me. 
So based on that, we have a motto, Lord, we are accepting your call. And that is with us all our life. And we try to put that idea with our four children. And I praise the that. Lord, the four children are missionaries of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in four different countries now, one today. Of, one of your sons is a, is a musician, yes. right? Yes, yeah, he so inherited. So that musical mm, thing Nita, right there. <laughs> my wife plays very nice organ and piano. I play piano also. So that music uh, that we love is w with the four. You know, the four kids study piano, and the four kids study a uh, wind instrument. The okay. oldest, the trumpet, second, clarinet, then the girls, flute. So we had an orchestra at home for mm -hmm. worship each day. What do you think? I love it. <laughs> I, have, I, I have a harpist oh. and a piano player. My harpist now plays the clarinet, mm. and then my youngest used to play the violin, and she was learning the trumpet. So, yeah, we've... Congratulations. I, I did not grow up in a family. I had I did not get music. So yes. I was a singer. Yes. But not musical instruments. So we liked having my mother, experiments. My mother that was a widow since early in her life. She was a pianist, organist, and she loved music and she traveled to the capital of our state each Wednesday. The bus of the college was going for people that need to go shopping there. Mm -hmm was going uh, uh, 1 o'clock p.m. and returning 9 p.m. So was going to the city one hour for people to spend four or five hours and then return. And mother went there during four years to study and to become a violinist. Really? Violinist. So and she graduated. So she loved music and we love music and our children love music. I think Daniel, you know, here in Shenandoah Valley Academy, mm -hmm. He's the director of the music department, the I choir. I know you're very and, proud of all yes, of your yeah. children. Praise the Lord. <laughs> um, so I, I don't want to jump around too much. I, I don't know what happens between you becoming the union union treasurer and 2000 Toronto General Conference session and going to EuroAsia. Do you want to give a little brief yes. synopsis of what, what happens there? The, and then we'll get back to 2000. I was the union treasurer during three terms. Okay. Uh, that those terms at that time in the in the union conference was four years, so I was re-elected and I spent twelve years. But after that, the leaders of the church says, "Billy, you have been a lot of years here, the treasurer. Probably you you will have a, you will bless us going to the university." So it, it was arranged, and I was invited to go to the university as the vice president for finances, our Adventist University. Mm -hmm. and, and and the Lord, you know, always the Lord send us or take us through the best way because our children were growing up and already starting the university. So, so the Lord timing. brought perfect timing and, and I was able to be with the boys. You know, we love sports and soccer, football we call. So I was able to play football with them, you know, when they were growing up. So it was a great experience and for the girls also. So I was during five years, 96 to the year 2000, the vice president at the university. That gave me also a good idea how to bless and manage the educational institutions. Uh, and in the year 2000 in Toronto, we were invited to go to Russia. What do you think? From South America <laughs> to ask, Europe, so Asia. I, I know you said like what your family's <coughs> philosophy was based yes. off of, but that's a big transition. You know, I mean, it's it's... It's Russia. it's Russia and Russian language, probably at some point here. I mean, that's that's a big difference. Yes. What was that? Um, what was that transition like for you and your wife? Because it was a, a, a important or difficult transition, a challenge, let's say. But you know, uh, we we took to the GC session in Toronto, the Adventist College. Today, university, uh, the, the university, uh, it was already the university choir. And three of our four children were singing in the choir. So we were, as a family, and we brought the youngest daughter also. So the full family was there. When I was surprised by the GC leaders saying, Billy, are you willing to accept a call to go to Russia? We were all together that lunch. I remember they spoke to us at 11 a.m. and say, how much time do you give me? 
to answer. Uh, tomorrow I need to pray. And they said, no, at two o'clock we need this. <laughs> so it was only lunchtime. So I said to Nita, call all the children. And we sat all as a family with Nita and the four children. And, and then I said, the news. They are inviting us in this GC session. They nominate the three leaders of each world divisions, plus all the leaders of the GC, and they are asking us to go as a treasurer of that division. But we don't want to take the final decision unless we will make now a committee and you need to vote yes or not. And they were laughing, said, Daddy, you already decided. <laughs> no, 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 I say it, it's serious. Because we don't want to damage, you know. Because it's a big, very difficult, a big transition. Uh huh. Uh, so I said, well, like in a committee, uh, we have a proposal. <laughs> Do we second? One second. Well, comments or questions? No. Okay. All the ones that are in favor, raise your hands. And all the kids, the four kids, raise their hand. Did Nita raise her hand? And Nita. Okay, was. just making sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the 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 situation is that later. To open my heart, we found with Nita that probably the girls, the, the two youngest or the youngest girl, probably suffer more. She was in the high school yet, mm -hmm. and very little. The boys already in the university, you know, many kids go by themselves and, and live there and study, but the girls suffer more. So I think that when we speak about mission, uh, Overseas, going from one continent to another, we call today international service, ISE, international service employee. Uh, so it's a sacrifice of all the family. It's a family decision. You know, and I think that we, we underestimate that mm -hmm. because, you know, we want different people to be in different roles or yes. whatever. You know, and I'm going to speak to something that's on my heart. We often speak about this with women. Yes. We want women in leadership, but yes. there's a there's a cost that comes to this, yes. and yes. it's it's often our families. Yes, and even just the transition for me, I just moved from Texas to Maryland, yes. but I uprooted my children in their middle school and high school years, mm. and they really struggled with yes. just that whole transition, leaving their lifelong friends. Yes, and when anybody is called to serve within this church. It really is a family decision. It's a family it's a decision. It's a family call. Uh, yes. And and we need to recognize the sacrifices mm -hmm. that our families give up to serve the call. Because it's not just us that give up the sacrifices. Yes. It's our families that give up. And although God, you know, is with us and he supports us and whatever, it doesn't make it always easy. Yes. But it's very rewarding yes. that although it was a sacrifice, each year we came to, to meet with all of them. And, and also we invite them to come to visit us and to visit Moscow and St. Petersburg and other cities. So we try to do all the best for them not to suffer so much that stress, that, that great you know, uh, when they are giving all, they, they are giving their parents to go abroad. Yeah. So that is a sacrifice. But thanks to the Lord, the four children decided to be missionaries now Amen. of the church, serving in different four countries. But each year with Nita, we are doing an effort, financial effort, and the church help us to meet with all of them. Uh, sometimes we can gather all and be all together as a family, now with three grandchildren. But otherwise, we visit them or ask them to fly and, and we help all them to, to, to be all together. So I encourage all the families, pray, be close to the Lord, and let's make all the plans together as a family. Yeah. And the Lord will bless us. So what do you think was your biggest challenge, besides maybe language, um, in moving to Russia? Yes. It's another culture. Another language, another part of the world. Different types uh, of food. Uh, food, yeah. But we got, got along. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. yes, yes. <laughs> I am vegetarian, or oh, uh, strange because I in, remember that because you in and South I. In South America, <laughs> in South America, they eat a lot of meat, good cattle, and so on. And in Russia, also fish and so on. Siberia, especially. Billy, you will not be able to be a, a vegetarian, but I was able. In all the places. I almost God. want to give you a high five for that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the Lord provides. But what, what is difficult also is the climate. 
it's very cold. You know, when you're accustomed to summertime, to go to the beaches, enjoy life, or a middle season, not so cold, the winter, and you go there with 25, 30 below zero, 32 in Siberia, I had uh, a time there. So, so it's tough. You're making me cold, just thank you. Yes, about yes, it. it's very cold. But uh, as I told you, with my wife, we commit our life to the Lord, and we spend there three periods of time. Two as treasurer and one as division president. And because of that experience that I told you, the providence of the Lord, how he's taking us uh, to work in our university. Uh, when I was there, we decided to, to uh, agree that Ukraine, in Ukraine, in Bucha, where we have the college, they may have a theological seminary. It was very difficult because my loved friends and colleagues said, Billy, you are forgetting that our division institution is Saoski Adventist University and Theological Seminary. But I said, well, you know, we come from other parts of the world where each union has an Adventist college and seminary. Yeah. Not one per division. You have one per union or more. Yeah. or more colleges. Therefore, it's, it's not a problem. It, and I encourage them. You will see. We will have students in Saoski, we will have students in Ukraine, and the Lord will bless, and we will grow to train better future pastors for, for the mission of the church. And that was uh, early 2012, when I was with the responsibility to be the division president. Uh, and, and we took the decision we, with all the consultation with the General Conference and the Education Department and IB, IBE approve it and so on. Uh, and so the two, school in uh, Pucha is relatively new? Yes. I did not know we, that. We had a course of theology for two years, but then they needed to send all the students to Saoski and graduate from Saoski. That was the division, theological seminary. But... In 2012, we decided for them to go for the four years okay. and, and, and graduate there. But you know what happened to 2014? Russia invaded Crimea mm -hmm. and, stood, and they broke relationships and students from Ukraine could not come anymore to Russia. Oh, wow. And the leader said, how, Pastor Bies, how you knew that what was so going to happen? But providential. I said, you see, we, we promote we promote new schools, elementary schools, and then high schools, and then the colleges to train the leaders and train our future pastors, and God blessed a lot. And, and the educational network of educational institutions, both in the Eurasia Division and also in Ukraine Union, have improved very nicely. And now with all the sad situations that we know are happening there, our schools are sustaining the mission of the church as well. So how long did you serve in Euro-Asia Division? 15 years. 15 years. So you got there in 2000, so 2015. 15. So that would have been San Antonio. Uh, San Antonio. I was there. Show? Yes. <laughs> and in San Antonio, the Lord, through the calls, decided so, for Billy to come from Moscow to Washington. It's a little warmer here. Yes. You're welcome. <laughs> um, I have a question. So twice now during a GC session, you've had calls that yes. changed change the direction where you thought maybe your life was going to be, yes. you know? What is it like <coughs> to receive those calls during a session? It's, it's very rewarding. It's, it's, uh, we are humbled, you know, for the general conference in session and the nominating committee to, to, to bring a call to you is, is a humbling situation. But it's very rewarding because, as I told you, since we graduate, we say, Lord, I am answering your call. So the Lord knows already that we will accept. Whatever call will come. And with my wife, we said, we don't need a, a, a high position or authoritative uh, position. We will go humbly wherever he will take us because he knows what is the best for us as a family and for the mission of the church. So it's not the position. Uh, so in one hand, is very humbling situation. In the other hand, is what the privilege to serve the Lord. Hmm. So I know that you have something you want to share with us. Yes. So I'm going to let you share that at the end. But before we get there, I've, I traveled with you once down in Brazil for about 10 days, I think it was. Um, 
And the one thing that I took away, which I now incorporate into much of what I do, is your love for 8.1 billion yes. people. You're the one person who I hear. You keep up with it because it was 8 billion last I knew. Now we're at 1.1. Mm-hmm. You talked right? about 7.5 or 7.3, I don't remember, in 15. So so you you keep track of this. <coughs> yes. Why? Because for each one of them, Christ gave his life in the cross of Calvary. Therefore, for heaven, each one is important, should be for us as well. And all efforts that we can do, and our opening, uh, openness to receive the power of the Holy Spirit, to reach to them, we should do it. So when we were invited here as a general vice president in 2015, San Antonio, Texas, uh, and Elder Ted Wilson assigned uh, through through the committees that we may help with communication, publishing, and Christian stewardship. Uh, the first meeting, I think, when we gathered there with Williams, you were here in 15? Not no. yet. The first meeting, the Lord put me that idea, the Lord. And, 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 and I said to them, let's make a plan to reach, at that time was 7.4 or something like that, <laughs> billion people. Let's reach them. And they were surprised, you know, how we will do it. Well, I quote Matthew 19, 25, 26. For men, this is impossible. But for God, all things are possible. So let's have big ideas, good plans, how to reach. In publishing ministry, I went at that time and said to Pastor Admin Maroney and all the team, let's put one book with a missionary, uh, a missionary book, with the three angels' message in each home of the world. What they say, how we will do it. But I'm pushing all this year. I continue. In each meeting, we are in. You are be- very be- relentless yes. in the best way. In the best <laughs> way. Because, you know, the world is divided by divisions. Division yeah. are divided by union. Union by conference or mission. And then we have the pastoral district. Let's make a plan. You, you make the plans. It's not so difficult. And put one missionary <laughs> it's not book. not so difficult. <laughs> put a book in each home with a message. A spirit of prophecy says that at the end time, the Holy Spirit will guide people to go to the shelves and take a dusty yep. book and open with I a message. I remember that. And they will take a decision to be ready for Christ's second coming. But the book needs to be there. I was a call porter for seven Can years. You, well, you know so very I, well. So I Congratulations. remember that quote. Because... <laughs> You don't know. We don't know the influence yes, yes. Of, of what we do. Yes. And sometimes we will never know until yes, heaven yes. the influence of what. Yes. What a, a book or a social media yes. post or whatever it may be. Yes. Um, and, and you know, uh, Alisa, uh, uh, many people say, Pastor Biazi, you are you are pressing with something that is impossible because we have enough church members in those areas of the world. But you know what? We have all the countries represented in New York, in different cities of America. In Argentina, we have all these European countries and from Africa. We have all the people living there. So if our faithful church members do that work here in these countries where we have all these people and they read and they accept the Lord, they will go and tell their families. Can you see? Yep. So so we need to think a a little bit. Strategically. Yes. so, so we have people from all the countries of the world living in many other countries, you know, with immigration, millions crossing borders. So, so we need to do the work that the Lord is giving us. So I have one last question, then I'm going to let you yes. close with whatever here you want to share with us. Um, you're a little bit older. I'm just going to leave it a little bit older. Okay. <laughs> experienced. Um, <laughs> experienced. <laughs> Wise and experienced. Um but you seem to really grasp the fact that the digital world is here to stay. Yes. And I don't think you fully even understand all of it. No. <laughs> but but I you trust. 100% yes. support, empower, and encourage this. And I, You know the dream that I told the, to the communication team? You were not here I was yet, not, but so, some so will remember. You should tell me now. Yes. You should tell me. The dream was when I, we were making this meeting, I challenge you. To reach 7.3 or 4 billion people. And I challenge you, I said, that in each phone, 
each morning when the people were, will awake, it will pop up a message to them. And they were looking to me and said, well, this is a crazy pastor. Pop up, does the phone know when you get up? Yes, it does. Yes, because <laughs> we, we go and read. What, can you see? So what will happen, I said to them, is a 15-second message will come there. Have a nice day! And, and a message of health or whatever, you know? And disappears. And the guy said, but who sent it? And then next morning, again, then he pays more attention. And let's say that in that short message has like a Hope Channel logo or church logo, Hoping. whatever. <laughs> and then the person touched there and will open our web page with an offer of prayer, with an offer of Bible studies, you know. Billions of people, because we have more cell phones than people. Not all have, but several. Apparently many people some of us have more than phones. one. <laughs> but, but you know what impact? And they said, but who will go and convince Apple company or convince Samsung company? I said, well, we need to search. Probably we have a faithful person of our church or any other church working in those companies like vice president or whatever. So that is a dream that yet needs to be fulfilled. Noted and putting on my notion page. <laughs> <laughs> can you see? Why no? And, and I said, and when we go and speak with this company, we need to put it as a sell. Because if it is an encouraging message, encouraging is, is a point of sell. You can say to Apple, you know, if, if, if people buy and they are happy with those messages, they will buy more. And the same you say to Samsung and so on, no? So why not? Uh, nothing is impossible for the Lord. And I dream that it will come the time, uh, well, Sam Williams, all, all, you all are working hard to encourage all our church members to use the, the internet and, and the social media, you know, to communicate and span. And, and that is good. But I think we need to do something more, more impacting, more massive, you know, uh, to reach all the people. Thank you. I just, I just want to bring that up because I, I'm so inspired. Um, oftentimes when I talk to people, and they, they mention about, you know, oh, everyone in the general conference is old. They probably don't get it. And I'm like, that's actually not the truth. Yes. Um, and although sometimes they maybe don't get it, what I find is that people like you empower those people who get it. Yes. You, you create this beautiful vision, this dream, this goal for us to attain. Yes. And then you allow the people who have the skill and the knowledge to go get it. Our, our grandchildren are ready. No, oh, I don't. My, young kids, people, yes. my kids are crushing they, they me know. already. <laughs> you know, uh, somebody says, for our age, Make a gesture that will show that you are starting your radio, and we'll do like this. But mm -hmm. to the actual children, it's like this <laughs> digital. <laughs> can you see? Yeah. So, Go ahead and share so, some words so for the us. Lord is blessing us, and all can have a part. That is amazing. The Holy Spirit can use little kids, four years old, five years old, teenager, young people, adults, elderly. He can use all, and we should be uh, involved. And I want to finish with this wonderful message of Paul writing to Hebrews chapter 10. Because all what, what he, we have spoken today is the work of the Lord through our lives. But the great promise is, is yet to come, correct? Mm -hmm. Great grandfather and mother left Europe to come to South America and they are resting, awaiting the second coming. And some people can say, well, but the decades are passing. How you can hold to hope? But I want to encourage all the ones that will see this program. And Paul writes in Hebrews 10, verse 35. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. Don't throw away your confidence, your trust, your hope. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. Hmm. 
and but my righteous one will live by faith. And I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. And it's a little bit sad. Some people go back. But then he comes again with hope, Paul, and says, but we are not. We do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. So that is my wish for all my family and friends and neighbors and for you, Alisa, and your family and all the ones listening to this program. In a little while, he who promised will come and not delay. So God bless you. Thank you so much, Billy. We hope you enjoyed this episode of a and Profiles with my special guest, Billy Biaggi. If you haven't already, please take a moment to subscribe to this podcast, YouTube channel, wherever it is you're tuning in from today. I don't want you to miss any future episodes. Thank you for spending this time with us and join me next time as I continue to get to know the life stories of more inspiring people. <laughs>